Uh, so, so Peter, welcome to A. Many years back, he moved from Australia to India, lives in an Indian village, and uh, and is someone who has worked the closest in A with the artis village artisans of India. Welcome, Peter. Okay, thank you. So in 1998, when Arvinda and I went back to India, we went to Mumbai, and uh, and there was a fair of the NGOs in Mumbai. And in that NGO fair, we were looking for items, and we were angry, uh, we were really we liked some bamboo chairs that an NGO was selling. So we placed an order for that. The next day, a knock came on my home, and when my mother opened the door. It was Peter carrying this bamboo chase, come to deliver it. And he was he's from Australia, and that's the job we met moment with Peter. <laughs> <laughs> that's when we first met uh, met Peter. And of course, my mom has met many aid volunteers. Peter from opening the door saw her burner and straight went for the kitchen, wiped the flame to increase it. And she thought, finally, there is somebody from aid who is of use to her. <laughs> uh, so, Peter, I'll ask you now what I asked you that day. What was an Australian doing in India and how did you get here? Okay. So, um, I was previously working as a marine engineer uh, on tall ships, the square inch ships, uh, like the pirates used to sail. Um, and I had an accident um, and injured my back. A friend of mine suggested that uh, you know that I should um, you know try uh, therapy in a place called uh, Pondicherry in India. And uh, so I came and I took therapy. I lived in Oroville and my journey started from there. I met you know the villagers. I met the people there and slowly started to work and it just took off from there. So you came to India to get your back uh, you know from all your shipping accidents uh, you know done uh, repaired through yoga and you continue to you know stay with uh, uh, with uh, with the you know Indian uh, roots. Uh, so so when, when we met you Peter you were also working with IIT uh, Mumbai on bamboo products. Uh, so my journey from you know from Tamana to uh, Maharashtra and then working with the NGO where I met Ravi Naravinda. Um, we uh, had been asked to come and help them work with the artisans to try and um, you know create the uh, new products and to create a market. Um, so we uh, were able to meet a professor in IIT Mumbai, Dr. A.G. Rao, and he was starting what was called the bamboo cell. So we worked with him closely um, to design you know, products, to design techniques and also the tools and teach the village artisans you know, new techniques and things and uh, try and uh, create a market for the you know, products that they are producing and things. So, of course, many of us experienced this in the U.S., but we don't imagine this happening in India. So, what happened was that six months ticked by, Peter was on a tourist visa, and he had to go back to Australia, though he wanted to continue in India. So, what happened then uh, in Australia, Peter? Ah, so, this happened for a few years, you know, back and forth, every, you know, six months back and forth, went to Australia, worked a little bit, came back to India, did some work, and then again had to go back. And on one of the return journeys, we, um, I was met with some people in Australia and we actually started a chapter of Aid Australia. So um, we had uh, gone, you know, to do a fundraiser there and um, one of the uh, guests who had come to the stall, I was cooking doses at the time. <laughs> <laughs> She saw us and, you know, looked at the work and things we were doing and um, thought that, you know, it had value and convinced her father, who happened to be the um, Indian ambassador, <laughs> to give me a visa that enabled me to actually stay in India and renew while I was, whilst I was in India. So that, you know, enabled me to sort of uh, concentrate and focus more and, you know, reach out more. So Peter got a visa suddenly with an X on it, which meant that he could just stay forever in India if he wished. 
thanks to the ambassador's daughter. Uh, and then Peter, uh, from Maharashtra, the journey took us to Odisha and to Tamil Nadu when the tsunami hit. Uh, so, I mean, basically I follow the disasters, if you like. So in 1999, when the... Uh, um, the super cyclone hit Orissa, I, you know, moved from um, Maharashtra and went and worked on the, uh, initially with the rescue and then later on with the uh, rehabilitation of the villages, working with livelihoods, working with the artisans and things. And from there, uh, as tsunami hit, I also moved, you know, uh, to do the same thing, to work with the um, rescue and then the rehabilitation and things. So one of the um, you know, an approaches that we had uh, with the tsunami, everybody was giving new boats and things, but no one was going to see. So we um, created a, a community center, taught the fishermen uh, how to repair their own boats, how to repair their own motors. And we actually put the very first boat in the sea after the tsunami, and I was one of the, you know, crew up on the boat that we went. So, um, on return and things, we had a decent catch, and we all shared within the village and stuff. After that, you know, people were confident because they understood that, you know, if there were any issues that did arise with their vessels, they had the capabilities to actually resolve them and things, and so slowly, you know, people got back to sea. So what was amazing uh, during tsunami time was that Peter could actually work with the fishermen directly to teach them how to repair the boats. And he not only went on the first, and he says that us was the first boat that went back into the sea after the tsunami. Uh, and he went with it, uh, as he said. But what he did not mention is that he's a vegetarian. <laughs> and, and when they caught the first fish, what did you do, Peter? I had the, you know, Enjoyed the celebration with them. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that gave them a greater confidence to get back into the sea uh, after the tsunami, because obviously psychologically they were, they were very badly hit. Uh, and then uh, the work of Aid India, of course, in, at, at the time of tsunami with Balaji Sampath and others was very large scale. Uh, and Peter, you set up a livelihood center? Ah, yes. So, um, after the tsunami, you know, with Aid India, we uh, established a livelihood and education center uh, south of uh, Chennai. And there, um, we were able to connect with a, um, a company who actually manufactured uh, wind turbines. So their packing crates and their packing material and everything, we were able to upcycle and actually create school furniture and education items and puzzles and things. So the school furniture was actually purchased by the company CSR Wing and distributed to seven states throughout India. And the puzzles and games, uh, the puzzles and the educational tools and everything uh, were distributed throughout Tamil Nadu and things. So Peter has had this amazing workshop going on, uh, you know, and seven states when he says actually uh, this size, uh, these, uh, the, the packing material of these windmills, Peter, can you describe the timber? And, uh, and so, how big I mean, was? absolutely beautiful timber. It was, you know, uh, pine from Norway and from Scandinavia and everything, 10 feet, uh, 10 inch square and up to 15 to 20 foot long. So it was absolutely beautiful, you know, material to work with and things. So we, you know, were able to get the machinery and everything to size it down and to create all the products. And, and this would have just been thrown to waste, uh, you know. Yeah, for, it would have just been scrapped. To, yeah. to, uh, you know, to, to make something creative. And I must add that my daughter also, but she was very small at that time, she played with all these toys and educational puzzles that made out of wood. And I mean, I was saying, this is the real thing, like, made out of wood so don't uh, let's not give anything plastic uh, to play with uh, uh, so one of the things uh, you know uh, regarding scale so tsunami allowed aid the first in india and in Tamil Nadu to be scaled up the other way in which we tried to achieve uh, a scale was working on alternate energy devices uh, and uh, so peter we were also working on the hay box if you remember so this uh, the, this was a device which an ordinary village person could afford and therefore, uh, with what two or three days salary by paying 300 rupees, 
uh, and therefore it had the potential to be marketed in villages itself at a very big scale. Uh, so Peter, can you tell us about the Haybox experience? Uh, so we called it the easy cooker. Um, yeah, easy cooker, yeah, easy. <laughs> <laughs> so basically it was you know, a bamboo vessel with uh, a rice straw lining. So uh, the insulated property is allowed for residual heat and you know, cooking. And so this um, not only was marketed you know, locally with the villages and things, but also to city markets and things. People utilized it for as a hot box, if you like, for keeping at least warm, at least stall. It was uh, used by the Anganwadi or the uh, village uh, kindergartens to you know, cook and save on uh, the gas and things to cook the meals for the children and things like that. So, yeah. So, so Peter was so is so good at converting ideas into actual work items. That crazy idea, like once I was suggesting that we create a pot that does not cast a shadow anywhere inside the pot. So that uh, you know, uh, so create it for eight hours of the day, so that the UV rays from the sun can filter the water uh, for for in villages like Narmada Valley. So Peter just got a potter and work with him to, uh, to create this pot that casts no shadow inside the pot. Uh, similarly, Arvinda was suggesting creating uh, slings uh, to, to be carry, uh, on which we could carry babies. So many aid volunteers grew up wearing these slings uh, that uh, Peter uh, created uh, in Orissa and Srikakulam. So Peter, you moved next to Orissa where we set up the Alternate Rural Technology Center for doing all of this kind of interesting work and something very alternate happened in your life, so what was that? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, we set up the tailoring unit and things and uh, employed the locals, you know, um, to work with us. And so one of the locals uh, actually became my wife. So <laughs> <laughs> we now have two children and, you know. Uh, yeah. And what are your children doing, Peter? So my daughter is um, just starting her 11th standard, my son in fifth. So they've gone through uh, the local, they've, uh, all their schooling has been with the local uh, village school, the Telugu medium and everything. Uh, and only now just transitioning into the CBS as, you know, 10th standard has completed and things. So both my son and my daughter are both in the same school and, you know, now trying out with CBSE. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, Nirmala comes, uh, you know, from a family, his wife Nirmala comes from a family uh, whose home again did not have electricity, so in that entire village was again dark and uh, efforts of aid also uh, uh, led to electricity connections for their entire village. And Nirmala was a day wage worker and, and her parents and she learned tailoring and, and now, you know, they live in the village. Uh, uh, so, Peter, you have worked with village artisans in various capacities. What do you think about artisans in India? What is their quality and what is the work ethic? So, I mean, it doesn't matter what artisans I've worked with, whether blacksmiths or tailors or the, uh, um, you know, the potters, or the metal workers and everybody. Undoubtedly, you know, every one of them will put a hundred percent effort in everything they do. It, it's not like, um, you know, we'll take special effort because this market, you know, is there. It'll be, it doesn't matter whether it's a local market or the city market. Everything is, you know, 100% of their effort. They're also, I mean, as they're called, uneducated. But they're able to actually, you know, assimilate very quickly new designs, new techniques, uh, tools and everything. I can give an example like we were working with uh, tribal girls to teach them bamboo craft and very intricate uh, fine weaving and in order to get the patterns in the bamboo it was actually a, a mathematical sequences so uh, you know a combination of these sequences and color uh, you know integrated into it gave the patterns and the you know designs and things and these girls were actually able to repeat these and understand these but not only that they were actually able to create their own designs also by understanding sequences but in theory they have no education 
Yeah. And yet, Peter, the artisans of India, uh, you know, don't have a workflow that gives them sales every day. So many of them are not able to, you know, get uh, a livelihood. Yeah. And they live in poverty. Uh, unfortunately, you know, particularly with the low cost plastics and other things replacing all of the, you know, traditional items and things. Many, many of the artisans are now, you know, without work and things. You'll see potters working in brick kilns. You'll see, you know, many artisans actually just doing day labor and things, you know, and living in very poor conditions and things. So, so then the next thing that, uh, you know, happened in air, of course, for scale was Kiran. Kiran happened in India. He went back to India again from the University of Maryland and started working in agriculture sector. And Kiran told me, Ravi, you are wasting Kiran, Peter's talents. He should be doing something at an even higher scale. And so Kiran and Peter then started uh, saying that we have to deliver millet machinery to the farmers. So in Indian villages, like any big village in India you go to, rice processing machines are there everywhere. Right? Like you will get your chakki for your rata. But if you think about the traditional Indian grains of millets and how they are processed, in Adivasi households, they might hand pound them or they might hand process them. But at a bigger scale that the whole village can use, that acres and acres of millet farms can use, the machinery is simply absent. So Peter and, uh, uh, and uh, Kiran uh, decided that Peter has to look at what are the what is the quality of the millet machinery that is available and what can be done to scale it up. Uh, so um, we tried, you know, working or looking at what was the machinery in the market that may be suitable for millets and we piloted a number of projects in tribal villages and things. But, um, you know, very quickly we found that it was inadequate. So we tried approaching the manufacturers to, you know, make iterations, make alterations to their machinery to ensure that they were suitable for millets. But after, you know, time and time again approaches and things, we got very little results. So, Finally, you know, we decided, okay, the simplest thing to do is to actually, you know, bite the bullet, if you like, and design the machines and manufacture the machines ourselves. So that's, you know, what we've been doing now. So, um, you know, we've successfully uh, managed to create now, um, you know, small, power efficient and, um, you know, um, process efficient machinery that's, you know, specifically designed for millet processing. So, uh, so a couple of things, Peter. So, in the machinery that the government is creating or that currently exists, you say that, uh, you know, the people who created the machines don't use them and the user feedback has never been taken. So, partly what you are doing is asking the farmers to give a feedback and then improve the design. And you also were talking about a circular economy. I mean, I'm sure there are many economists here. <laughs> so so what, what's that all about? So, okay. So, I mean, the circuit, see, the, the actual um, idea of, you know, um, creating these machines uh, in the village or suitable to be operated in the village rather than the material coming from the village into a processing center. These are micro units that actually set up in the villages where um, the produce is grown and things. No? So this enables what we call a circular economy. So, um, you know, the farmers produce the product, it's locally processed, it's locally consumed, it's locally utilized. And that helps to rebuild the, um, you know, economic situation in the villages and prevents, you know, migration and things like that, which is now very prevalent. But um, we're hoping also that, you know, it will also encourage, you know, future generations to stay in the village. Like now, you know, very few farmers or um, artisans and things will actually, you know, um, encourage their siblings, or their children to, you know, stay in the village. So this circular economy, uh, you know, will encourage that. So, um, and Ravi was saying about the, um, you know, existing machinery and things now. So, um, we're working on a project with the Orissa government at present to um, identify the pain points, if you like, 
um, of all the machinery that is distributed under any of the subsidy programs. So, okay, you want to show it through the video, one example? Okay, yeah, we can. So, Peter has a workshop now in the village which makes these machines. Transform Tech designed the multi grain thresher with the user's experience in mind, and they have found it to be easier to operate, clean, and move than their earlier machine. It also costs less, consumes less energy, and processes more per hour. Compare the Ragi Thresher of OUAT with the multi-grain thresher made by Transfarm Tech. So we've gone to the next step to actually design a machine that, um, you know, entails all of the requirements of the user. So, um, you know, it's woman friendly, it's ergonomic, it's economic, it's, uh, you know, it's a very lightweight machine. And this machine is also designed as a multi-commodity. Multi so that other machine, I mean, literally, if it belonged to a farmer, they would use it two to three days in a year. You know, the rest of the time it would sit idle. If it belongs to a self-help group, a women's self-help group, maybe they might get one to two months use out of it per year. This machine is designed as multi-commodity. So when one's, uh, you know... Is that up one crop is over? One, yeah. The next crop can also be, you know, threshed with the same machine just by simple modification, simple changing of components. It's all interchangeable, it's very easy to clean, and it's, um, you know, runs on half a HP. So it's, uh, we also have a solar version of this, so it can run just, you know, without any uh, electrical requirement and things. And also, you know, very cost effective. So like this, um, we're, we're both trying to create this, um, ensure that the machines that are distributed through the programs comply you know and are um, as required by the user so we actually um, formulate a, a list of SOPs the standard operational procedures that are then submitted to the government the government then submits these to the manufacturers they have to comply with these before actually the second phase of their distribution through the programs and things. So we're trying to, you know, through policy, actually ensure that, you know, the money spent by the government and the machines that are given through the programs are actually, you know, usable and useful to the end users. So, uh, so, so Peter, I think... <laughs> There are two successes in this thing. One is this final machine, which is much simpler, you know, even more aesthetic and elegant to look at than the original, you know, big thing with so many women were trying to carry, right? Doing a better job with, with multi grain. Now, this Peter has, is manufacturing in this village and selling it. It's already sold 50 of these machines. The other one, which he has modified it, which actually government supported. That has now the modified machine has got permission. It has got clearance. So, yeah, our, if by the manufacturer. We can just go back to the last slide. And then we then did. Oh, last slide, the, the slideshow? Yeah, the slideshow, yeah. So. Um, so uh, these are the three machines basically. So a hala, a de stoner, and a grading machine. So we now have um, what's called ICARDS. So the Indian Council of Agricultural Research has certified our machines after two years of analysis and uh, testing. They've given us now you know, a 10 year certificate of efficiency and effectiveness for these machines. So, uh, so that's amazing work Peter, you know, like starting out in India, living in India, children growing up in India, working with so many aid volunteers, Nanada, Balaji, Kiran, Narvita, 
all of us. Uh, so, what did you think about the solidarity with it? I mean, you are part of it. Peter is as much a part of it as any of us are here. Uh, and uh, and what do you see the future? I mean, see, coming from you know Australia, like uh, coming to India as a single person, um, you know, with no understanding of the languages, no understanding of the culture, nothing. Um, you know, aid has been my support and my, um, you know, security blanket, if you like. You know, that's helped me to progress and to interact and to work with all the different villages and things like that, knowing that, you know, there is somebody that I can converse with, that I can talk to, that I can, you know. My definition, you are a, yeah. you have been a party of a, a full participant of a, ever since I have known you for the last 24 years. Uh, thank you, Peter. Do you have one or two questions if you're running out of time? No, I think that... Uh, there is one sentence I want to share with you. Once you have heard everything, can you describe Peter? Peter can be described as the best engineer I have met in my life without ever having gone into an engineering school. <laughs> Like in Big Bang Theory, when a physicist praises an engineer, <laughs> it is a high praise. <laughs> Mohan being, you know, one of the most renowned physicists, I think it was yes. Gilbert. We call him an engineer at heart, but firstly, this is real engineering. I just want to make sure I can get two questions from the audience. I'm sure this was a riveting uh, presentation. I love the uh, question-answer format. Any questions? Just two questions I'll take. We will have more Q&A later, but any burning questions? Order. There you go. It's amazing to hear how much you have done. I think you have set an example for a lot of others who are actually from the motherland. And I guess education uh, is the key uh, to see how anyone can help others who are not as fortunate as we are. And uh, looks like you set an example of how you could use your education. And uh, did you see, uh, we, we normally see a lot of people who are not educated but very skillful. Did you see a lot of people who are, uh, what a bit of innovation among the, the people that you're working with and they could be lending a lot of helping hand or that they didn't go through a formal education? So, yes, definitely. I mean, actually, I also have no formal education. I managed to pass primary school. <laughs> but I became chief engineer in the Merchant Navy. I've advised government officials. I've advised, you know, all of the UNDP. I've worked with, you know, KBIC. I've worked with DC Handicrafts. I've worked with, um, you know, KBIC. Um, and, you know, many of the universities, both private and government. So, um, I think, you know, I was at the advantage that I was um, equivalent to the villagers, to the uh, artisans, so I was able to assimilate with them and work with them. So I believe that, actually, you know, they have the real knowledge, they have the real education, you know, so, yeah. Call you as an anthropologist. <laughs> okay, you really call me as an anthropologist. <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much. Uh, is there any? I, I promised two questions, so there's one question there, uh, Ravi. So I wanted to know: um, Are you in any way possibly connected to any of the Rotary clubs in any of those areas in India? Um, so, 
I mean, I have friends who are Rotarians and things like that. I personally am not, you know, I don't, um, you know, partake in any of the activities and things, but I have many friends, you know, who appreciate the work that we work with and things. And um, yeah. Have you been able to get any grants or anything, any kind of support from any of the Rotary Clubs? No, no. No, you just haven't pursued it? Yeah, I mean, I don't have any real, uh, you know, it's it's a, um, a proprietorship that we have now. Uh, it's just progressing into a partnership, my wife and I. Um, but it's a very new thing. Like we're basically a startup, you know. Uh, um, this machinery and things like that has taken, you know, two years to go through the process of ICAR certification and things like that. And it's it was it was not our um, idea to actually get into manufacturing and things like that. No, it just sort of fell on us. Uh, we're slowly, slowly learning, you know, about it, and you know, hope that the idea is that um, these machines will reach the people and enable them to create this circular economy. That was, you know, the whole idea behind it. So support for the work. Um, we are hoping to find some way that we can, you know. Because Rotary offers global grants, but I would not be able to initiate a grant here unless you can help me reach a local Rotary club there, which says that yes, we take this project under our wing. We'll definitely work with you on that. So the agency office.